Good morning, everyone. It's Madeline with Together SC. We're thrilled to have you with us uh, today for a conversation with Donna Waits. Donna has been sitting in the hot seat, the CEO, as the new CEO of Sisters of Charity for uh, right on three months right now. Right, Donna? Yeah. And uh, when her um, uh, position was announced back in the spring, I said, we want to get you on with our people so they can hear your vision and what's planned. And so Donna and I have a, a, a few questions that we've uh, reviewed that we want to go over and um, we'll be sh go through those. But then again, if you will share in the chat room uh, your name, your organization, if you have a question you'd love to ask, uh, put a cue in front of it and we'll go through those at the end. And Donna's got a lot of her team on the call as well. So we're going to get the good chance of meeting those. Um, but Donna, as we said, it's been about 90 days since uh, you started, mid-July, I think. Um, we all know how important the first three months, six months are to the work we do as executive directors, particularly building the relationships with our boards and our staff. Um, you know, what have you been doing and what have you learned? What are, you, what are your ahas from this first uh, uh, three months? Thank you, Madeline. Thank you all for, for being here um, and for allowing me to get to know you a little bit better and you to get to know me a little bit better. Um, so for the first 90 days, if, if you haven't met me before, I have just become the president in July, but before that I was here um, almost eight years at the foundation. Um, so different than a brand new to an organization CEO might have, their 90 days may have been different than ours. And so I took the first um, few months of the time that I've been in this hot seat, as Madeline said, to look um, at the relationships with our board and our staff um, to really make sure that the board that hired me the board that's known me for almost eight years, but also now is going to be working with me in a different way, um, that we built a relationship based on uh, on the new era of, of the work of the foundation. So with board and staff, I have dedicated time to spend one-on-one -on -one with each of them. Um, and for board, it has been to... Um, again, to create a relationship that's a different sort of relationship, but also to seek their guidance, to seek their input and their feedback, and to set a tone from the very beginning that um, I want that feedback and that I want to be held accountable um, to be carrying out the mission of the foundation. And I went through an interview process to get this job, and so they all heard me several times talk about my vision and talk about the goals for the foundation. And how I would improve upon the last 26 years. And so these first few months, really asking them um, for their feedback on my plans from the get-go so that they know that, that I want their input and that I want them to hold me accountable. Same with staff. Um, I actually started meeting with staff one-on-one -on -one prior to the official transition, um, having been a peer for several years and now transitioning into to oversight, um, wanting to make sure that that was seamless and built on, again, trust and transparency and that they felt safe enough to tell me what their hopes and dreams were, but also some of the things maybe that they hope would change. <laughs> um, and so taking, taking all that into consideration has been really important to me these first few months. My next phase is then to start meeting with fellow funders, some of whom are on the call and other partners and getting into the community to do similar things to, you know, you may have known me in a different position, but as president, I, I want to hear you um, in a different way. And, and I want to make sure that that um, relationship stays open and if, if not stronger. I love that. Uh, you know, as those of you that have been in CLS with us, which Sisters of Charity helped start, know the importance that uh, Charles Weathers and I place on uh, the building that trust by saying, here's what I'm going to do in my first 90 days, and then going out and doing it and telling mm -hmm. them how it went. And, and I'm also often surprised how few people do spend the time to meet with their board one-on-one. -on -one. Mm -hmm. So, 
Uh, you know, so that's one of the reasons we like smaller boards, because we think when you get too many boards for one person to have meaningful relationships with, that board's not going to work. So that great advice on that. What surprised you? Any surprises that you've had? There really, there haven't been any surprises, but I will say affirmations, which has been wonderful. Um, I believe that we have the best staff in the world, um, but to hear from our board that they also believe that um, and that they believe in me and that they are excited, just as excited as I am to have me in this role. Um, but I think I have shared with, with the team that several of the board members in particular um, wanted to make sure that I continue to nurture the team that we have and made sure I am aware, which of course I am, that how wonderful they are and that we want to retain them and, and really give them the resources that they need. So not really any surprises, but affirmation that we're all on the same page right now. Excellent, excellent. You know, uh, Sisters is one of the few foundations that work statewide in South Carolina. And um, that puts you in a pretty important place to begin with. But then when you think about your mission and what you set out to do, eradicate poverty, you know, it is uh, pretty impressive. Now you've been doing this since you got there in 2015, but um, how do you see tackling this goal now that you're leading on the effort? Is that, you know, you've been part of the strategic planning process and set the goals, but does it, do you see any differences now that you're at the top spot? Yes, yes and no. Um, and I would say we doing it one day at a time is is kind of been my mantra for the past few months because you know, being new, but also having been here for a while, you've got these dreams and you've got these goals and you've got the, well, if I were in charge, I would do this. Or one day when I, you know, get to make the decisions, we would be so tamping that down just a little bit and focusing on the one day at a time. Um, is is how I'd say we're reducing poverty in South Carolina. Um, and, you know, that's balance. That's balance. That takes, you got to have the vision. You got to have your 10-year 10, 10 goal, your three-year goals, your one-year goals, but breaking it down into daily bite size um, bits of work and wins. You know, we, we ask our grantee partners and our applicants, what are your long-term goals, but also tell us about some short-term wins and short-term goals that you you hope to meet. And we have to do that for ourselves as well. Um, we're not gonna, I'm a hopeful person, but I don't know that the needle's gonna move that much in my generation, um, but we can celebrate the wins that we make along the way. Um, and I think one of those, uh, a type of win would be our collaborations with, with other entities. So while we may be, one of the only statewide funders focusing on reducing poverty. Um, we can't be the only ones doing the work. Um, and so the uh, the more people, the more nonprofit partners we have, the more stakeholders we have that are either public sector, private sector, other funders. Um, those are those are wins. That's how we're that's how we're tackling it. Is we're not doing it by ourselves, and we're not we're not taking on the whole elephant all at once. And you're, you're not just looking at the symptoms of poverty. You're trying mm -hmm. to address the causes and, and the systemic inequities. And you're working yeah. with state agencies in a way that, uh, and DSS, and, you know, in a way that our philanthropic community hasn't done as much in the past. So I, I love the leadership that y'all are showing. And I know we're going to talk more about the advocacy later, but I just, I love that you can have the same mission, but tackle it in a different way. Yes. And yes. I think, you know, I, I think it's so funny. I don't know whether it's easier to follow a really horrid executive director or a really good executive director. I know we all come in and we want to put our stamp on it, you know, say this is, uh, but you're right. You have to take the time because we'll come into those interviews and say, if I were ED, I would do this. And then you get there and you go, that can't be done. Or it is so unimportant compared to mm -hmm. these other problems. So that listening and, and, and working incrementally, those are two things that I really have, think work for all of us as executive directors. But, you know, have your, does your background and what you 
have done in the past? How does that inform your personal vision for um, the work of the foundation and your work as a leader? I mean, we, you know, mm -hmm. let's speak to your vision first, then we'll come back to management. Uh, well, I guess they kind of uh, coincide, but um, background growing up, um, I grew up in Gaffney, South Carolina. I don't know if we've got any folks here from there. Um, but a rural area of our state that, um, you know, experienced some some tough times, um, as many towns did when when the factories and the mills closed. And so um, growing up, knowing uh, the lack of resources that exist and the barriers that exist for people, especially in rural areas, um, I knew I wanted to do something to affect change, but I, of course, didn't have any idea what that would entail um, growing up there. Um, but that's never far from my mind that I knew there were great people and, and passionate people and people on the ground in the communities helping each other out. But we could never quite um, get the resources to come into the communities that we um, that we needed. And we still, you know, they're still struggling with it. And a lot of areas in the state are struggling with it. So as as a funder and as a statewide um, influence, if I can use that background to help influence change, to know, to knowing the gifts and the assets that do exist in communities, they just need the resources and maybe they need some help in removing those barriers to truly realize the potential of the community and the people that are living there. Um, so, so that's a little bit of the, the personal um, behind the why behind. Um, I love doing what I do. Um, when it comes to the leadership and the, the management of, of the foundation, um, I've always had uh, a passion for and a curiosity for what makes people be successful. What is it? that um, a, an individual or a community or a nonprofit may need um, to reach their full potential. And so I get to do all of that with this um, to match the passion with the talent and the gift and the intellect and just give them the resources and the support and be the cheerleader that they need and be the encourager that they need. I will say often, I am not an expert at really anything but I surround myself and want to be in rooms with people who are the experts at helping people. Um, so I'm probably going to just be the biggest cheerleader in the room. Well, and that we all need cheerleaders. And in fact, I think that is an important role that the philanthropy plays. They're the ones that lift up and say to the community, these people are doing good work. Believe in them. We believe in them. So mm -hmm. I, I say that's a, you're in the perfect spot, Donna, <laughs> given that, that background. Um, so what about management? Uh, you've got a team of what, half a dozen there now? Seven. Seven. Excellent. Yeah. And, you know, I don't think any of us as execs say, I want this job because I want to manage people. We say, I want this job because I believe in the mission. I want to change lives, as you just said. And then mm -hmm. we get into it and we realize, you know, it's all about the people whether it's mm -hmm, the board, mm -hmm. it's the staff, it's the, those we work with, our clients, our you know, the community. Mm -hmm. Managing people is what we do. So yeah. how, have you, how have you wrapped your head around that responsibility? Again, I, uh, I'm very, very blessed that I already knew this staff and that we were already, um, we already uh, know a lot about one another and what makes each other tick. Um, but before becoming president, Tom, my predecessor, for those of you who don't know him, gave me a lot of, of leeway in, in doing some of that culture building. So we've, we've done a lot over the years to really get to know each other, to, whether it's um, uh, doing Enneagrams or disc profiles or, you know, things that I love that not necessarily everybody loves, um, but just ways to know how and why people tick. I know that every single person on this team has a passion for the mission, every one of us. That's crucial. And I'm just so blessed that that, that exists and inherited that. Um, but then we go about our jobs in different ways. And individually, we, we have individual goals about how we get there are different. Um, but I've 
in committed to investing in the culture and the trust that we have and keeping it. Um, but that doesn't mean it's always, uh, we don't always agree on everything, but if we have a safe space to where when we don't agree that we can talk to one another and we have some tools in our toolbox for those conversations and um, and we know we're coming from a place of respect. We, we have core values in this organization that are more than just on our website. Like it truly every issue that we may have, we can point right back to, well, this is where I wasn't necessarily living in the value of justice. Let's talk about that. Um, so that is um, also a culture that I think we all have with our partners. Um, I hope that if a grantee partner or nonprofit or other funder or other partner were to encounter our staff, that they would get that same type of vibe that is um, living within values. And that maybe we may call out someone who's not living in their values or maybe just not, um, not um, being respectful of the people that we care about. So it's, a, it's internal, it's also external, it's also, it's just holding each other accountable. I, you know, I think we often underestimate the importance of core values and culture and managing an organization. In some ways, that's the most important um, legacy we as executive directors can leave to really help solidify what those values are and that culture is and ingrain it such that when we walk out the door, people keep living those values. Mm -hmm. You know, they don't go with us. And um, so that's, I think that's a, a phenomenal way to, to think about the management part of it. Um, you are one of the few groups uh, working uh, statewide, as we said earlier, and you talked earlier about wanting to build partnerships. What opportunities are you seeing as you start talking to uh, other groups and other philanthropic partners, and even maybe some national funders to recruit to the mm -hmm. state as you enter this sort of second phase of, the, of your early uh, mm -hmm. days? Um, what I believe that we are seeing is one of the bright spots coming out of the pandemic. And then um, unfortunately, prior to the pandemic, when we had um, the natural disasters that our state has experienced, um, seeing the power of coming together, I think has just been an evolution that's been a really wonderful part of some things that have been very tragic that our philanthropic partners, whether it's through the South Carolina Grant Makers Network or other, other ways that we are seeing that we are better together. Um, I'm definitely seeing a lot of that. And it is harder as a statewide funder, one of the only few um, who, who can look at it from that lens when I'm trying to talk to, when I'm talking to Mamie in Greenwood or I'm talking to Susan in Lancaster, they have geographic constraints but I know that they want what's best for the whole state. We know that. Um, but we're so we're learning together ways in which, regardless of geographic constraints, that we can all work together to help make that tide rise. Um, and then the opportunities for outside funders, for people outside of South Carolina, whether it's corporations or other foundations or agencies, um, national or regional that see great value in South Carolina and see great opportunity here. Um, our state hasn't always necessarily embraced outside um, support. Um, so I'd love for part of my next, you know, phase in building relationships to help us all to understand that that's not necessarily a bad thing. That if an, a funder from somewhere else has worked in a similar state, they've worked in Alabama or they've worked in similar communities and they've built a, a repertoire of best, best practices and research and it can work here, um, why not invite them to come and let us learn about what they've learned? It, you know, don't reinvent the wheel and um, just encouraging those of us who can make those decisions to open the doors and welcome support while keeping the community, of course, first and foremost. I mean, I'm 
definitely not advocating for any entity or funder to come into our state and say, this is what you need to do to fix South Carolina. You would never hear me say that. Um, but if we can be um, a voice for the communities that we serve until those entities can get to know our communities at the local level, I see that as a great opportunity for us, not just us, but other funders in the state to do the same thing, to, to leverage. We, we don't have enough money to fix South Carolina. None of us do. Um, I don't, it, it's going to take so much more than, than money. It's going to take other places and other people who've done similar work and learned some lessons that we can modify um, based on what we need. Well, and you've worked very closely with the Duke Endowment which you yes. know, is North Carolina, South Carolina. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a, been a very effective partnership in getting their engagement in the state. And we mm -hmm. always want more. And then Mary Reynolds Babcock Foundation has a new exec. And I'm, I'm very eager for some help in getting them connected back to our state. I had a call with some of their team. And I think there, there's some opportunity to, to help strengthen that. So maybe that's one we can work on together. Um, mm -hmm. But um, now... One of the things that I think you guys do so well is the whole grantee grantor partnership and how you approach grant making. Um, uh, you've got a wonderful open door or open email or open phone call, whatever the, the term is now for inviting people who may see a fit with your vision and their, their mission. Um, can you talk a little bit about that process and what you've used and maybe how that's changed a little bit over time? Sure. Um, yes, it's definitely evolved over time. Um, it's fun to look back and see how far the foundation has come in 26 years. Um, but the past few years, our, our strategic plan, which started uh, January of 2020, um, one of the strategic intentions our board set forth was to sharpen our grant making, um, make it uh, more streamlined, more efficient, more meaningful and impactful. Um, so we do have, uh, we think, is a, a pretty good process in place to where um, to be as equitable as we can, that every organization has equal access to us. Um, and I've said this before, probably to some folks on this call, that we don't believe that it's fair that just because I live in Columbia and I might see you at church or I might see you at a grocery store, so you have access to me to tell me all about your program. Um, and then I take it back into the boardroom and say, well, I think we need to fund this program because she was really nice and she came into me at church. Um, because that's not possible, you know, for 46 counties, it's it's just not fair to the organizations and led by people who I'm never going to run into, or our board's never going to run into. So our very first door is, a, is an inquiry process that um, we, we want folks to come through. Um, so you may see me somewhere, or you may see a board member, and um, please just understand that it's out of respect to every um, nonprofit in the state that we say, hey, let's, let's go through the process. Let's come through the inquiry process. Um, and that helps you get to know us better, and us to get you know get to know you better. And from there, that's when we start to build the relationship to see if there is a good fit. If if your organization does in fact fit the mission and it fits into our grant making um, criteria, because the last thing we want is for you to go through the process of submitting a full application and spending hours and days on a full application when we could have told you pretty quickly that's probably not the the best fit or maybe the right time for funding. So. That's that's where and why we instituted the inquiry process. And then again, from there, if you are invited to do a full application, um, we we then um, activate a, a really wonderful, we believe, customer service sort of process to where we are there for every technical question you may have, if it's with the computer software or with it's we really, you know, I don't really understand what you're asking here. Then, you know, we want to be able to uh, and, and I know you all, you hear this from other funders, but when we get that application in as a staff, it's then our jobs to advocate to our board on your behalf. And so the, the better you can answer those questions, um, the better we can advocate for funding for you. So if you don't understand the questions or don't understand what it exactly we're asking, um, that is where we would rather you get clarity from us, whether that be setting up a phone call, or emailing us um, that you put forth the best application that you can um, because 
we're in the middle of a, an application review process right now, and there are going to be folks that aren't funded, it doesn't mean they didn't meet our mission necessarily. First of all, we don't have enough funding for everybody who made the request, but also um, some organizations just do that thorough answering of those questions. And it would be great if, if every single um, applicant, um, you know, were able to take the time and really understand what it is we're asking and why we're asking it, why it's important to answer it fully. But then I would have an even harder job, right? Um, because I have a finite amount of money. Well, uh, roughly how much are you guys doing, granting out a year? And what are the programs? Because I believe you've got a tiered process. So yeah, yeah. So this year, it'll be right under $3 million that we will um, grant. Um, that that changes from year to year based on the market. Um, we're funded through our earnings, um, but that'll be this year. And yeah, so there's three categories of funding that the majority of organizations working with people experiencing poverty typically fall into. Um, you're either working to meet the immediate needs of people who are experiencing poverty, and you know that's access to healthcare, access to quality childcare, access to quality um, uh, basic education. Um, that's organizations that are working with people who are experiencing homelessness. So uh, these organizations are really stabilizing in moments of crisis. So, so that's a, an organization, um, types of organizations that come through that category of funding. Um, another category is what we call breaking the cycle. Um, and those organizations may also um, support immediate needs of people, but they're taking it several steps further. And they're using um, either their own research or their own evidence-based practices or others um, that are successfully breaking the cycle of poverty for people, uh, either people, uh, individuals, families, or communities. Um, and so they're able to give us in their application the the either their own track record, like I said, or if it's a new program, it's only been around for a few years, if it's based on a successful model from somewhere else that has the evidence to show that uh, economic mobility, mobility occurred and true positive impact happened. And then the last category is what we call systems level change. And those um, ideal applicants are were, have identified one of the, and we, we tie it back to now our poverty study, the study, the study that we did in um, 2020, where um, structures that are in place in our state were identified based on data um, as being the, the, the causes and reasons for people who uh, are in poverty and, and keeping them in poverty. So if you're in systems level change, then you are gonna be connected to one of those structures. And so we do, we link the application to our um, poverty study and we ask you to let us know which of those structures you're working to address. That is the most complex category, really. It's hardest to explain. It's hardest to, to really quantify because it's um, sometimes it's research, sometimes it's advocacy, sometimes it's uh, forming coalitions and building community organizing groups for civic participation. Um, all of this also is on the website. So if I miss something, you can always go back. But that's um, kind of in a nutshell, the three avenues for funding and, and the, the ones that you would choose from if you're interested in applying. You, you would self-select which of those categories you need to apply in. I love that, that sort of layering, stabilizing the individual, the family, the community, changing the future for that family, the community, and then addressing the causes so no one ever has to have that future again. You know, removing that would be, barriers. Yeah, that um, would be ideal. And, and that was purposeful from our board's um, directive. Again, when we um, created this current strategic plan, um, they challenged us to emphasize more on breaking the cycle and um, systems level change when it came to um, when it comes to amount of funding. They've asked us to invest more and they've asked us to um, dig a little deeper in those. So incrementally, um, if you were to look at our pie chart, you would see that the 
investment for immediate needs has gotten smaller. And so it has gotten more competitive. So if you're planning to apply there, please know that it's not that we don't value the work, but we've been challenged to make that long-term change and that'll take time. So it might be a percentage point each year um, that we are, are kind of changing that upstream approach. Donna, one of the things I've noticed is so many of us are so focused on the stabilization and getting the food and offering mm -hmm. the charity. And we have this wonderful opportunity to connect with those that are in need, but it's what, you know, what food do you need? Not why do you need food? And yeah. I think sometimes we uh, forget or don't even realize the role we can play and trying to uh, understand the systemic inequities that are causing that and to give voice to those that are experiencing it and lift that up so that those barriers can be removed. Uh, mm -hmm. In fact, just as a side, you know, we've been doing these removing our blinders calls for a year and a half. And with the summit, we hope to pivot to removing barriers because we think that process of identifying the barrier, understanding its history and why it's there and what the inequities are that may have caused it. We're not as, as trained in that as we are trained in delivering human need services. And so um, we're looking to do a session on that at the summit. So maybe we need to get some of your um, grantees to be part of that, because I think there's an opportunity for us mm -hmm. all to learn a little more effectively how we can help uh, remove those barriers and make those system level change. So maybe that's- a well, It's a hard shift. It's a real hard shift. And, is, and being is. founded by the Sisters of Charity of St. Augustine, who's um, uh, for the centuries that they've existed, have really put an emphasis on feeding and housing and, and just making sure that everyone had those basic um, necessities that everybody should have a right to have. Um, it's hard to to shift. It's not an easy. And it takes got, a got to do both. It often takes a different skill set. You know, yeah. it's one thing to help someone who's been evicted from their house find a new house. It's another to figure out how do I change the laws that allow that landlord yeah. to evict that yeah. person. And you know, that's why this pipeline of the talent that we need in our sector is so important. We mm -hmm. need people with a different sort of skill set to tackle some of those inequities. And we need to develop the skills of the people that are already caring and doing the work. So um, I know you've got some of your team on here. I want to tee them up and maybe we can start by talking about what you guys have been doing with advocacy at the State House and why and how that became part of your toolbox. Uh, because mm -hmm. I don't think that every foundation, particularly private foundations, think that it's in their purview to be able to do that work. Mm -hmm. And yet, if we don't change the systems, we will be, you know, addressing the needs forever. Right, right. Um, so in terms of how that kind of came to be and why, I, I think you've used the word why we're all in on advocacy um, before is it has evolved over the last 26 years. Um, it's been in play probably the whole time that we existed, um, but with a track record, with um, the reputation that has been built over the years as being nonpartisan, as being people-centered, mission-centered, um, we have gotten a little bit of um, influence you know, uh, we use the word power and, and I don't mean that in a, in a negative way, but it exists. And so if it exists um, and we've seen that legislators or decision makers are willing to not just open the door when we knock, um, but they're actually calling us to ask for information on how better to serve their constituents, um, we've just capitalized on that momentum. And in the past couple of years, really, uh, as a, as a board, um, not just approving it, but encouraging the beefing up of our resources and our time. So China Phillips, who I think is on the call, is our senior director of policy and research. And um, our newest team member who came in January of this year is Sarah Catherine DeBenny, our community outreach coordinator, um, who now have so to have the dedicated staff, not every foundation is going to have those um, 
resources, but we're real lucky that we do, um, that they're able to focus on the data, the research, but the community building, listening to the community as a part of what they're doing right now, um, so that when a decision maker does open the door for us and says, hey, tell me more about what you've learned, it's coming from the community. It's not just um, what Sisters of Charity Foundation thinks. It's based on data. It's based on real lived experiences. Um, so, hey, SK, hey, China. <laughs> we hope you all join the conversation because one of the things as an outsider watching you that I think you all have done is, and I'm remembering back to when the new exec for DSS arrived, China, and mm -hmm. you guys did the reception and you did a gathering and you've said, okay, here are the groups we're funding. Here's the state agencies that they're working with. How do we strengthen that partnership? How do we show that state agency we're supportive of them, not just fighting them? Um, yeah. And, and you know, was that in fact one of the early things you did and what influence did it have? Because that's something I think others could learn from. I think there are other mm -hmm. ways that other funders and nonprofits could learn, could develop stronger partnerships mm -hmm. with the state agencies that, that serve the people they serve. Well, I would, I would love for China or SK to chime in if they're a, a, available. Um, but China just said Donna was part of every single conversation. So that <laughs> may be her way of telling me to take it. Um, but, but Madeline, really what you just said just hit the nail on the head. That um, I, when I spoke earlier about internally and, and holding one another accountable in a loving and respectful way, um, we have the same ultimate goal as our state agencies have to provide for and to help encourage um, uh, support for people in our state so that they can be successful and prosperous. Um, when the trust is built with the foundation or the, the nonprofit and the, the state head agency head or those who are making decisions know that we're coming at it from that perspective and we have no agenda. Um, so if we do push back, or if we do challenge, if we do ask for consideration to think of way, new and different ways to do things, they know we're coming from it purely for the, um, uh, for the intention of, of caring for people. And, but SK has raised her hand, so Ellen oh, and China did too. So go for it, girls. China, I'll, I'll defer to you if you'd like to, to start. Right as I took a bite. Um... <laughs> Um, I will share that the, in two ways, it wasn't, sorry, Donna, it wasn't a way to just um, say that I wasn't going to answer, but I think the community often sees me speaking, but they don't know just how much conversations you are a part of, right? And that before I went out in community, I was brainstorming with Donna on some like ways in which we can like tackle these issues that I know for the women that came before me um, have tried, right? And so it was Donna and I brainstorming on how do we move this ship um, that has been stuck for a little while or that we've done advocacy in a certain way but haven't always elevated community. And so um, that was a huge piece as well. So I'm just taking a step back so, so the rest of you can see what we always get to witness um, as well. And I'll just kind of piggyback there and say, you know, those conversations, I was, uh, that is why I am here. That's kind of how I was uh, created and, and why I was welcomed into this organization and this sector. And I think with this freshest lens of being new to uh, philanthropy and nonprofit world, uh, truly recognizing the, the dedication that this organization, organization has to uplifting that community voice um, and how funny it is that that voice is often forgotten in, in other, not necessarily what I've seen in South Carolina, but you know, as you're reading all the, the research that comes out and all the, you know, Council and Foundation, all these groups that put out information um, all the time, you always want to ask yourself, where is the community voice? Uh, and, and again, I think that's just the, the beauty of why this position, why I was created to continue to support that and ensure that our grantee partners, our other funder partners, community members who are maybe a member of a nonprofit, but their voices need to be heard to further the advocacy in a way that is centered on them because they do, they have the knowledge and the expertise uh, to recognize what solutions are going to be most suited for them. And you guys do probably some of the uh, most in, uh, 
extensive grant making to community-based organizations. I don't know how many would fall into that category of your grants portfolio, but mm -hmm. I, you know, you, you know who's on the ground in their neighborhoods doing this work. And now you're starting to do advocacy training for them as well. And I think that that is a phenomenal service to be offering them. And for the rest of you on the call, the exciting thing is that, you know, what Together SC loves to do is when we see people doing good work, we say, oh, oh, let's share it with others. You know, we're run by nonprofit leaders for nonprofit leaders. And so this year's summit, which is in March in Columbia, we are gonna uh, incorporate advocacy into that effort in a way we haven't done in 20 plus years, maybe ever. And we're doing that with China, who is generous enough to serve as the leadership team for our advocacy allies, the chair of that leadership team, and Donna's help in figuring out what the programming should look like and how we can engage our elected officials and our state agency heads and our corporate allies. Because as Donna said, you know, changing systems requires everyone. We might be able to feed folks, but we can't change the systems unless we're working with everyone on it. So Donna, who else is on your team is on the call that we might, folks might want to meet? And Oh, I would love to highlight Erica Wooten, who is our Director of Diversity, Equity, Inclusion, and Belonging, who just loves the spotlight on her. <laughs> Alex is probably really going to put the spotlight on her with the way this is. <laughs> Erica, can you join us? Alex, you may have to. Uh, sure. <laughs> Good morning. Like we gave you a little bit of warning. There we go. Oh, there you are. So this is um, our fearless leader in the space of, of DEIB. Erica's position was created um, at the beginning of the strategic plan because one of our three major strategic intentions was to look at diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging as a driver of poverty and how it's all related to the to our mission. Um, and so Erica has just steered the ship through, as you all know, if she started January of 2020, you know what <laughs> occurred uh, three months later, six months later, and, and thereafter, which really intensified the, intensified the need to understand why it's important to be inclusive and equitable. Um, so, Erica, did you want to add anything? Well, I guess the only thing that I will add is when you talk about our grant making um, and uh, how we're shifting focus, or not shifting focus, but how we are um, expanding it to more of our breaking the cycle and systems change, when we talk about advocacy and the need to have everyone at the table, um, you're speaking to systems and um, um, institutions that create barriers that um, make it difficult to impossible for people to get out of certain situations. So um, while we definitely want to um, provide services that we do with our immediate needs grants, when we start talking about breaking the cycles and systems change and policy, then we really get into why are people um, disproportionately affected by these certain issues. And once you start to dig deeper into that space, you realize it is because of, um, it's because of the history and the systems and the institutions that are in place that are working the way they were geared to work, which has put whole groups of people um, or that has marginalized whole groups of people. And so as we really think about the work of the foundation, we have to think about um, how that's impacting the work that we're doing and how we need to see how we can better address some of these really structural types of um, issues that we're dealing with. So I got to give a plug. Um, as I mentioned earlier, we did a Removing Our Blinders series and Erica was good enough to help Tom with his call. So um, we'll be sure to send that out if anyone's interested in hearing because I think that was good work. And Donna, I know you're going to be continuing that, the, the equity work. And Erica is good enough to serve on our 
equity task force leadership team for our equity um, peer network. So those of you that are, are looking to work on issues of equity, please consider uh, signing up for that peer network um, and the programming that's gonna be happening through that. I think Beth Ruffin is staffing it. She's doing amazing work and learning a lot from you, Erica. We're all learning a lot from you. So I have to share, one of my ahas was we were doing a call once and um, we were in breakout rooms. It was during COVID and we were talking about housing and um, someone who worked for an organization that addressed the housing problems. Uh, I was, we said something about redlining and this young woman didn't know what I meant by redlining. Uh, mm -hmm. And I thought, how do you work in housing and not know the history that we have of saying to people, just because of your skin color, you cannot live in this neighborhood or just because of your skin color, you can't get a loan. We've redlined the district with a community where you can live so you can't get a loan. And that, that whole history and inequities in the housing in, that it caused and the inability for people to uh, accumulate wealth. And, and so we really need as nonprofit leaders to be sure that our team uh, teams are doing the hard work of understanding our history in these areas. So, and um, if you need a sense of resources and where to start, Erica and the Sisters of Charity have shared a great, uh, a number of resources on that. Erica, what is it? You have a document that is a lot of resources. Is that on the website? You remember the one you shared with me way back when that was your definitions? The glossary. Yeah. Um, I believe that is on the website. Yes. Yeah, if you, if you guys have a link to that, let's let's say, share that in the chat or something. Sure. Just, you know, the first place is understanding what the, you start by understanding the terms, right, and what they mean. Mm -hmm. So, um, folks, I want to give you a chance to ask questions. There's so many great folks on here. Many of you know that Donna and her team already. Have I left anyone from your team off, Donna? Is anyone else on? Uh, the well, Kim Fronapple, who's our director of operations, uh, was going to try and, and hop on. I'm not sure if she was able to because she's usually directing operations. <laughs> we love Kim. We love Kim. She, she is our backbone. And if you ever need anyone to make great cookies, I love the cookies she made for our 25th anniversary. This too. She has a, a very delicious side hustle. <laughs> and and you said Meredith wasn't going to be able to join, but do you want to? No, that's right. So Meredith is our program director, and um, she is she is our go to uh, for all all of our grant making. Um, but fortunately, or unfortunately, we are in the midst of making recommendations to our board for this cycle of grants. So um, sadly, we missed her today, but she's doing what she needs to be doing. You know, Donna, that's a good point. I see a question from Nancy. Is there a timeline to apply for the different categories of funding? Mm -hmm. This this may be on yeah. the website, but if we want to share that, absolutely, it's on. It's definitely on the website. Um, we have we, uh, the the cycle of funding that we are reviewing right now is our last cycle of funding for 2022. So we will be announcing 2023's deadlines and um, all of the processes that uh, the steps that you need to take. Um, we'll have that posted by December. Um, and we foresee it'll be very similar to this year that there will be a spring deadline and a fall deadline. And so it's important when you do get to the website that you look for the dates for when is the inquiry form due, because that's your first step. Um, and then when is the application form due or the, the full application due. Um, so those two cycles, inquiry, application, and funding in the first half of the year, funding occurs around 1st of June. Um, so for people who are planning, um, and then the second cycle of the year funding happens in November, and that it'll probably stay very similar next year. We're just looking at four dates right now. Yeah, and when you get those, we'd be glad to share it in for good connections because sure. we know it helps people to plan ahead. Because you know, the, I as someone who was a former funder and is now often writing the grants, it is really. Um, frustrating when the grant writing process takes more time, costs more money than the grant yeah. that you're able to receive. So, um, mm -hmm. so I see some folks uh, chiming off now. Tony saying, thank you. Bye, Mamie. Uh, anyone with questions? Because I'd love to just open the, the call and give you a chance to even, if not questions, at least say, good job, Donna, and we're glad to be working with you or ideas on 
things that you would um, want Donna to know, know about. <laughs> Donna, I see grooms. I see your comment yeah. about the importance of collaboration. Mm -hmm. You know, it is funny. Uh, I think we as funders, or used to be a funder, whatever, have often talked about the importance of nonprofits collaborating, but we haven't always walked the talk ourselves. So yeah, yeah. Uh, the collaboration. Yeah. Yes, there will be a recording of today's call. We'll probably share it in Tuesdays for good connections. And like all of our recordings, you can find them on our YouTube channel. So question, I see one. Can you share more about your vision for public-private partnerships? Any specific examples that you would want to talk about? Oh, sure. Uh, I could talk for a few hours on that. <laughs> um, the, the, the importance of public-private partnerships goes back to everything that I was saying earlier that um, philanthropy is important and nonprofits are definitely important in making change, but we can't leave out the people who in the public sector. Those are decision makers that are um, that have quite a bit of power in our state, and we want to make sure that they are at the table with us and on the same page with us. Um, an example, uh, right now we are a part of, we're an ambassador for the Sustain SC program, which I believe recently you may have heard from. Um, and we think that's important to be at the table and that this, this group is paying attention to because um, the folks in our state who care about commerce, who care about economic development, who, um, yes, they care about sustainability um, and the environment and all of those things are so important, but making sure that we um, don't forget the communities that are being affected by some of those decisions. So we're, we're, we're grateful to have been invited to be a part of that discussion for a lot of reasons. I, I, we, we have the same goal. We want South Carolina to be great. We want people to live here and thrive here. Um, and so uh, we as philanthropists, we as nonprofits, if we can influence the public sector in the way that they're not just looking at the bottom line of what's best for their, their um, personal economy, um, but matching that with the assets that already exist in the communities, um, building, starting younger in education, starting in fourth grade and, and even, even below and thinking about that pipeline that so many companies in our state say just doesn't exist. Well, it actually does exist, but can we work together to nurture that pipeline so that we don't have to rely on talent from, from out of state? So again, I could talk all, all day on that, but that is a priority of mine and of ours to make that a stronger part of our work. You know, we did a session last month with Ethel from Sustain SC mm -hmm. on the sustainable development goals, yeah. because I realized that so many corporations were beginning to use those, some global, national, even local. Um, to uh, guide their grant making and their community work. And I'm like, how can we, we need to be thinking of along those same lines if we're gonna coordinate and collaborate with folks. So mm -hmm. there's a wonderful recording of that. And I think we'll be doing some sessions on it um, at the summit because Great. it's 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 setting a common language that we can all, and, and goals we can all work on. Exactly. So I think that would be. Uh, helpful. I'm so glad you mentioned that. Um, and maybe we should include that link in for good connection on Tuesday too. We'll see. Anyway, Donna, thank you so very much for this time and for bringing your team on and for the hard work of, of being willing to listen to everyone and think thoughtfully about what's ahead and bring change and the way that we can all absorb it and work with us on that. And, Thank you for believing in the, the communities that you believe in. I uh, I think I'm awfully glad you grew up in Gaffney. <laughs> you know? I, I, I'm, I'm awfully, awfully glad to. So I, I, I'm that that experience because the, the Milltown experience affects, you know, at least almost half of our state. So anyway, mm -hmm. um, thank you all for being here. Have a wonderful day and uh, let us know how we can help. <laughs>